Broadband World Forum in Amsterdam. I'm here with Ronan Kelly from Adtran. Ronan, thanks for joining me. My pleasure, Ian. Um, you were talking on your, uh, during your presentation about soaring usage that we've seen, um, partly through COVID, but just as other applications come on stream. And, yep. you know, it raises a question I think you asked, is, is GPON dead? You know, is it not going to be enough in future? So, you know, where's GPON dead, I guess? Yeah, no, it's a, it's a very valid question. I think one of the key things that we're seeing is the choice that's been made by new entrants coming into the market yeah. is increasingly they're moving towards XGS Pawn as their default choice. So G Pawn, they're they're leapfrogging that as a technology. But what we are seeing is for those operators that still have scale, very large numbers of customers in the millions, they still very much need to sweat that price point of G Pawn for many years to come. So what we're seeing is a strong interest now in combo pawn technology that allows them to deal with those users that have those you know high bandwidth requirements or heavy usage requirements, while they can still preserve that very very low price point for their normal users. Okay, and is it quite easy to do that? I mean, is the technology there that allows you to sort of move this combo stuff in? I mean, you're talking a bit about that. But yeah, so, that's yeah. the great thing about it now is, the, the, like, certainly the, the new OLTs that we're bringing to the market, whether it's on our TA5000 platform or whether it's on our disaggregated SDX platform, they all come with combo ports. So basically, it's a case of what transceiver you put into the port. So the combo transceiver has both the GPON and the XGS PON electronics and optics inside the package. So it's a much simpler way way of doing it, a much cleaner way of doing it than if you were to go with an external coexistence model where you have an external combiner and then separate GPON, separate XGS PON chassis trying to feed that signal in through an external combiner. It just takes a lot more space and it affects things like your link budget and stuff like that, yeah. whereas the combo approach is just, it's cleaner all around, more power efficient as well. Yeah. And, and in terms of where this is all going, I mean, I know it's probably sometime in the future, but we hear people talking about 25 GPON and 50 GPON, and yeah. there's been a bit of a debate in the industry about that those two technologies. Sure. What's what's Adtrans kind of perspective on how that's going to play out, I guess, over the next few years? So I think, first of all, the most important thing is those operators that are building out pawn networks today should take a lot of comfort from the fact that there is a lot of future technologies coming through. There's 25 gig pawn being pushed by one or two of the vendors out there as a non-standard approach. You've got the ITU pushing the G.HSP, which is 50 gig symmetric pawn. Early work has already started on 200 gig coherent pawn. So, you know, there, there's a a lot of capacity coming down the road. The real question is, when does it make sense to introduce it into your network? And that needs to be considered on a couple of fronts. One front is the cost of predominantly the CPE side of things to the ONT, because that's what really informs you know, the, the cost of an overall solution deployed out there. But secondly, the generation of chipset that's used to deliver that technology. So for example, if I roll out, let's say 25 gig capability today, that's going to be based on 16 nanometer technology. But the market need for 25 gig is probably 10 to 15 years out from now, where the OLT chipsets at that stage are going to be on 3 nanometer technology. So you're talking probably a 75% reduction in power on those 3 nanometer chipsets versus the 16 nanometer. So you've got to ask yourself, when's the right time for your business? Particularly, you know, with the PON networks today, we have the capability to overlay point-to-point -point 10 gig wavelengths and 25 gig wavelengths over that PON infrastructure today. So for there, those very small number of things like small cells or very large enterprise that we want to feed off a pawn fiber network, point to point, point to point overlay very comfortably addresses that need. Yeah, it's kind of a, a sort of bet on how things are going to play out. Yeah, but, exactly. Uh, and I think the key thing is, we saw GPON lasted, you know, it's 18 years old this year, nearly 20, and it's going to continue to be deployed for a number of years as we go forward. XGS Pond's just coming out of the traps. It's got at least 10, if not 20 years in front of it before that'll start to come under pressure. So I think the conversation is a little premature at the moment, but as I say, for those that have the pressing need, point-to-point -point overlay fits that need very, very well. Maybe just to finish, and it's a bit of a change of subject, but uh, you're talking about Wi-Fi becoming a kind of bottleneck now. We're talking yeah. about all these big big bandwidth technologies. Yeah. Um, what's, what's the issue there, really, and what do you think you know, needs to be done about it? The, the, there's two approaches. I think first, the first challenge that we've had traditionally is the amount of spectrum that was available to us. Um, as we move into the new Wi-Fi 6, and particularly Wi-Fi 6E, we bring a whole chunk of new spectrum in, so that's going to help. But what we've seen in the past is the Wi-Fi environment is an RF environment, and as an RF environment, it's a very dynamic environment that's subject to interference from lots of different sources, whether it's the microwave oven or the video sender or whatever it is. So what the service providers are really starting to understand now is it's not good enough that I just throw out Wi-Fi 6 gateways. That will solve the problem in the very short term, but then as the load starts going up on the network, all the interference problems are going to start to present their old heads again, basically. 
and create challenges for those service providers. And that's where we firmly believe moving into an AI-driven cloud environment for management of all the ORF environment that's out there off the different residential gateways and extenders is a key part of that because you can't throw humans at this problem. You can send an engineer out to fine tune somebody's Wi-Fi environment, put it on the right channels. He'll be five minutes down the road and the neighbor will arrive home and turn something on and it's all messed up again. So you have to throw AI at this to stay on top of it. And we're seeing that now with self-optimizing networks both in the cellular world we're starting to also see it now proliferate down into the Wi-Fi world with things like the OpenSync interface. We're seeing cloud applications being applied on top of that so we can fine-tune the hardware on a real-time basis and deliver you know, that amazing broadband experience. Okay, great. Well, thanks very much for joining me today, Ron. Ian, my Thank pleasure. You. Cheers.